Yes. Let's start. Okay, so uh, the following is going to be a data collage of sort, a cut up, a somewhat frantic attempt to gather data, find patterns, and reveal the big picture. Um, if some of the things that I'm bringing up sound too, too uh, harsh, you can imagine a question mark at the end. So it, this is going to happen in three acts. Um, first, distance, second, language, and third, amb ambiguity. First, I have to confess, I am biased. Maybe you know that about me. Um, maybe you read it in my bio or can identify it in the way that I speak. Um, I am a human. I am also a humanist, um, and I know this is no longer considered as cool as it used to be. Um, and yes, I still value politics. That's even less cool. Let's start with distance. We will first leave the atmosphere to question the technosphere. Apollo 17 was the last mission to the moon, launched in December 7, 1972. Ignition sequence started. All engines are started. We have ignition. Two, one, zero. We have a liftoff. We have a liftoff, and it's lighting up the area. It's just like daylight here at Kennedy Space Center. The Saturn V is moving off the pad. It is now clear the power. Power goes complete. Bring the roll, Bob. Roger, you know, looking great. Bob, good on all five engines. As it was starting its journey, leaving the atmosphere, um, six hours after liftoff, Apollo was positioned in perfect zenith between the Earth and the Sun. Astronaut, astronaut Jack Schmidt pointed the camera back towards Earth and took this picture. The blue marble, the first photographic proof that the, that the world is indeed round. One of the most widely distributed photo, photographs in history. You've probably seen it before. Uh, but is, it, is that the way you remember it? What's wrong with this picture? This is a clip from the West Wing. Plain and simple, uh, we'd like President Bartlett to aggressively support legislation that would make it mandatory for every public school in America to teach geography using the Peters projection map instead of the traditional Mercator. Give me 200 bucks and it's done. Really? No. Why are we changing maps? Uh, because, CJ, the Mercator projection has fostered European imperialist attitudes for centuries and created an ethnic bias against the third world. Really? The German cartographer, Mercator, originally designed this map in 1569 as a navigational tool for European sailors. The map enlarges areas at the poles to create straight lines of constant bearing or geographic direction. So it makes it easier to cross an ocean. But yes. it distorts the relative size of nations and continents. Are you saying the map is wrong? Oh, dear, yes. Now uh, look at Greenland. OK. Now look at Africa. OK. The two land masses appear to be roughly the same size. Yes. Would it blow your mind if I told you that Africa is, in reality, 14 times larger? Yes. Here we have Europe drawn considerably larger than South America. When it's 6.9 million square miles, South America is almost double the size of Europe's 3.8 million. Alaska appears three times as large as Mexico, when Mexico is larger by 0.1 million square miles. Germany appears in the middle of the map when it's in the northernmost quarter of the Earth. Boy, relative size is one thing, but you're telling me that Germany isn't where we think it is? Nothing's where you think it is. Where is it? I'm glad you asked. The Peters projection. It has fidelity of axis. Fidelity of position. East-west lines are parallel and intersect north-south axes at right angles. What the hell is that? It's where you've been living this whole time. Should we continue? Uh-huh. So. You're probably wondering what all of this has to do with social equality. No, I'm wondering where France really is. Guys, we want to thank you very much for coming in. Hang on, we're going to finish this. OK. What do maps have to do with social equality, you ask? She asked. Salvatore Natoli of the National Council for Social Studies argues, in our society, we unconsciously equate size with importance and even power. A 
I'm going to check in on Tommy. Go. These guys find Brigadoon on that map, you'll call me, right? Probably not. Okay. When third world countries are misrepresented, they're likely to be valued less. When Mercator maps exaggerate the importance of Western civilization, when the top of the map is given to the Northern Hemisphere and the bottom is given to the Southern, then people will tend to adopt top and bottom attitudes. But wait, how... Where else could you put the Northern Hemisphere but on the top? On the bottom. How? Like this. Yeah, but you can't do that. Why not? Because it's freaking me out. Indeed, a South Up map or a South uh, Up blue marble would have freaked everybody out. Um, and, uh, and NASA had to flip the image before distributing it to, to make sure it complies with our expectations rooted in hundreds of years of cartographic standardization. I'm not arguing South Up map is right or wrong, but I am arguing our terrestrial need to frame a floating glo globe in these terms is meaningful. And NASA's intervention tells us something important about the rela relationship between reality, the way we record it, and the way we use it to see the big picture. For thousands of years, we were poetically too close to the surface to actually know where we are. Ships crossing the, the ocean couldn't tell how fast they're moving or if they're moving at all. They developed a technology, the log, an actual piece of log, of wood. It was used to create a distance between the static point or datum on Earth and the moving boat. The, the knotted rope, the, the log line, would stretch to reveal how fast the, the boat was going. Until today, sea speed is measured in, in units called knots. It wasn't really accurate, but it was useful enough in figuring out the speed of the boat. One year after the Blue Marble, the US satellite-based global posi positioning system, GPS, project started. The first satellite was launched in 78, and the system became fully operational in 95. Again, the technosphere needed to distance itself from the atmosphere to actually to accurately log terrestrial datum. Still, GPS data is inaccurate. Looking into G uh, Google's logs, we can see how they try to accurately describe the data's inaccuracy and to poetically measure the quantif and quantify levels of confidence. Act two, language. So what about the language we use to log all of this data? Half a century before we started challenging the physical boundaries of our world with space travel, Wittgenstein wrote, the limits of my language means the limits of my world. Um, if we can't expand the limits of our language, how can we expand the limits of our world? But as William Burroughs suggested, maybe language is, is external to us. Maybe it's even extraterrestrial. Maybe we humans could develop a language beyond our human languages and a brain beyond our human brains. Alan Turing pondered, can machines think? He suggested using binary language as, as this mathematical truth as a possible better foundation than human language, and a computer to proce process and speak that language. Because if language can be external to us, it would mean that we are not alone. Not alone in the universe, and we're not alone, uh, the only intelligent beings in the technosphere. Now, I know your booklets say that trauma is the language of the technosphere, but the, for the sake of my argument, I would suggest that information, or rather data, is the language of the technosphere. Act three, ambiguity. Let me address this ambiguity. Zeros and ones answer a simple question. Yes, no, black, white, zero, one. It is not very useful to us, but 
it can scale to more complex questions like what, where, when, questions of information. And w what about why and how? Questions of knowledge, these are harder. Um, what, and, and questions like what next? Questions of wisdom or decision or policy uh, that require deliberation, uh, they are even harder. If making such decisions is hard for us as individuals, they are even harder on a society level as public policy. So different thinkers tried simplifying them in different ways. To simplify things, Margaret Thatcher famously argued, there is no such thing as a society. There are individual men and women, and there are families. Much simpler. Um, Ayn Rand would suggest, Ayn Rand wasn't that uh, committed to family values. She would suggest to simply focus on individuals. She also argued we should leave these questions for the markets to solve. Norbert Wiener developed a cybernetic way of addressing these, question, these hard questions through inputs and outputs, or feedback loops. Retracting back from the human language to a system theory with basic rules like zeros and ones. Kevin Kelly would suggest we focus on information. Whether it be DNA, zeros and ones, or what have you, it is all information. Kelly used to talk of a technosphere, but, but more lately he's been using the term technium. Ray Kurzweil argues, information defines your personality, your memories, your skills. He advocates the near future of the technosphere in the singularity. Speaking of language, Google recently renamed their version of the technosphere Alphabet. They've hired Kurzweil as their chief futurist Google's uh, famous mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. If we consider it in the light of Kurzweil and Kelly, we can better understand why they're investing in self-driving cars, robots, and biotechnology. And why they've teamed with uh, Kurzweil and NASA to found the Singularity University as a training center for corporate executives and government officials. In his provocative book, Kelly's, Kelly tries to examine all of these things that technology wants, right? So technology wants a lot of things. But what about profit? It seems like that would be following the same trajectory. Isn't it, but, but if we think about profit, isn't it what, is it what technology wants or is it what capitalism wants? In line of Kurzweil's affinity for exponential growth, Larry and Sergey would ask, can you please add speed? And we just talked about that now. The way it, it, it dominates the digital arms race, it seems like speed might be the currency of the technosphere, um, at least uh, Google's version of the technosphere. Google's speed test interface asks, why are these numbers important to me? Well, they're important to me because speed as a value negates political deliberation and civic engagement, which does not comply with what Kelly argues technology wants. Shouldn't we be asking what democracy wants? I chose these thinkers not for their intellectual rigor, but for their unquestionable influence on politics, culture, and technology. These are the techno-determinists, or techno-libertarians. They claim technology holds a bigger truth, whether it be markets or packet switching. There is no room for politics there. We shouldn't interfere while they, speaking in technology's name, influence, influence and disrupt it quite substantially. They represent a specific intellectual perspective and a very specific political worldview. 
They call for the naturalization and depolitization of technology and markets. In the name of a scientifically objective truth between reality and data, it assumes a stable, un unambiguous, and scientifically objective understanding of the world. In, in that view, we can think of um, reality um, as uh, which we perceive mainly visually, um, and then we can encode our recordings of reality through data, which is a construct of language. Then by thinking of technological languages as, as external to us, we can think, we, we can imagine a clear objective, a political line between reality and data. Our machines process this data in a fast and efficient way. But when we need to see the big picture, we have to represent it. Usually visually using graphics. And, uh, and gr graphics share with reality, the, the, they're perceived visually like reality. Uh, and, and, uh, but much like data, they are the products of man-made language. The, this graphic is, uh, is useless for machines and is, is far from reality. The distance becomes a problem. So we try to depoliticize this graphic representation in a rush towards this imaginary objective line. This is what computer science and Wikipedia call disambiguation, a, redu a reduction not only of the image but of knowledge and culture or society at large, towards what, what can be more easily processed beyond the limits of our li limited human lingual worlds. It gives us clear understanding, simple collaboration, a common ground, so we can, also f so we can all fit nicely within the big picture that is sped back to uh, at us, but the price is re reduction, depolitization, and determinism. It is the current prevailing vision of the technosphere which I believe we need to distinguish ourselves from. It, it, sure, it sure is easier to think of individuals in input, output, in zeros and ones, but isn't it a bit limited? In, in Borges' uh, aptly titled On the Ex Exactitude of Science, he, 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 he talked about uh, a story of an empire where cart cartographers set, set up a map of the empire which has the size of the empire itself. Today, this is the myth of big data, that, that it is the documentation, representation, and simulation of reality at large, so much so that we ourselves are but signs on the map, subjected to its index. That map, was, that map in Borges' story was finally abandoned and forgotten. I, on the other hand, don't think data and its representation are useless and ought to be abandoned. But I still think, like Borges, that the, this map of the exactitude of science is a myth. Neither data nor its representation neatly document, represent, or replace reality. But they can still be useful. Rather than di disambiguate culture, we should call for reambiguation of society, of technology, of the technosphere. To conclude, rather than imagining a seamless representation of the world, I suggest we should consider and acknowledge and represent our understanding of the world as simple. We're probably not on top or bottom, we may be both, and even that may, may change. We should consider how our distance or lack thereof affects our judgment. We should acknowledge the limits of our languages, whether binary or other, and we should embrace ambiguity and, and appreciate its emancipatory qualities. Thank you. <laughs>